Okay, Joe, we're, we're ready to start here. Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome to tonight's uh, Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. I'm Joe Hammer, the clerk of the commission, and I am uh, chairing the meeting tonight. Our, both our chair and our vice chair are absent. Um, and I think the first thing we'll do is call the roll, and then uh, before we get into the public hearings, just go over quickly some of the procedures that we use. George, would you uh, be willing to act as the clerk and just call the roll for us this evening? You're, you're on mute still, George. George, can you unmute him, Peter? Or uh, he has to he has to do it himself. Here we go. Here you go, George. I already was, but I, now again. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, I I don't have the names in front of me, so okay, I can I'll... I can do that. Do you want me to do okay. that? Sure. Okay. Uh, Clerk uh, Joseph Hammer. Here. Uh, Jim Hughes. No. Nope. George Oikel. Here. Tom Dean. Here. David Edwards. Here. Michael Vieira. Here. David Drake. Here. Yolanda Antoniak. Tony Homicki. Here. Richard Roberts, Ryan Allard. So Peter, we have a total of seven. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven. Yes, seven, with Tom. Yep. Okay, um, so our, our first um, item tonight is a continuation of a public hearing uh, for, for Gacy building and engineering. Before we get to that, and we also have another public hearing, um, for those of you who may not have been at one of our public hearings, we start by hearing from the applicant and let them present their application. Uh, the commission members have a chance to ask questions. We then ask for any public comment or questions and then um, bring it back to the commission and the applicant has a chance to say some closing words and then we typically uh, will deliberate and vote the same night unless there's uh, questions and more information that we need. I guess the other thing that I would note, we have nine members typically participating tonight. We only have seven. Our rules require that there are five uh, positive votes in order to pass or approve any application or take any action. So if, if there were to be a vote of four in favor and three against on any particular item, uh, that item would fail to pass. Um, so I would just mention that. And if there's anybody from the public who's gonna be speaking, if you have questions, if you could uh, direct them through the commission to the applicant and we will make sure that they are answered. Um, going back to the Borghese building an engineering application uh, for special permit for an oil change use and associated site improvements at 750 to 752 Silasteen Highway. We began that on October 20th. And my recollection is I think there were um, issues and items identified through staff and engineering reviews. The applicant uh, wanted some time to be able to submit additional information and to answer those. So perhaps the best way to get started would give the applicant a chance to uh, describe to us um, all the all the new information and the responses. And Thank if you, you could please identify Borghese, Borghese Building and Engineering Company. I'm an engineer. Um, and I, uh, I think I, I don't have to review a lot of the information that we had discussed in the past, simply because this is not that old of an application. But uh, in lieu of that, what I think what we should do is perhaps go over the most recent letters uh, from uh, Engineering Public Works and the Planning Department. And I'll just review those briefly. Um, and substantially all or all of these changes 
have been made to the plan, but as we go through them, I will discuss a couple of things that I want to bring to the commission's attention. Um, just for everybody's edification, um, we discussed the three drive entrances that uh, lead to Silas Dean Highway. Uh, we, have, we have made improvements to the uh, entrances. The center drive exiting the car wash now has an ability for the cars not to exit on Silas Dean Highway and they could re-enter the property uh, through what I call a teardrop island. And um, that is to allow people, if they have to, after a car wash, to go back and use the, the, the bathrooms. Um, we've also um, uh, have a driveway on the um, south side of the property that has a two-way drive in case people want to exit directly without going through either the car wash or the Valvoline. And I'm going to remind everybody here that the customers that use the oil change do not gather their car. They stay in the car and they, they, they uh, have their oil change while they're sitting in the car. Um, going through the comments from the town, uh, on a letter of October 29th, uh, they asked us to clearly identify the proposed pavement reconstruction areas, and we have done that on our drawing SP4. Um, the uh, pavement uh, item number two, as on the northerly side and on the southerly side, there is a little bit of pavement that extends into the adjacent people's property. We have made a note that we will, before we remove that pavement, uh, contact the people and get their permission. Um, item number three, the water uh, control uh, calculations were, were asked to be recalculated and we did those. And we also, it's interesting, we had our or technics unit uh, in the back of the property in the lower part of the, uh, of the sump for the water quality. And we have moved it back uh, in a easterly direction. So it's not in that uh, area. Um, we specified and we attached documents that indicated that the uh, water treatment system does meet the requirements of the town. And that's attached, the engineering documents are attached for that. Um, we extended the sill fence on the Southerly property line all the way to the Silas Dean Highway. And uh, the fence around the dumpster, uh, we have an interesting situation that Peter brought to my attention and he was absolutely correct. Part of this property is in a utility company right of way. And we had shown in the previous plan some trees in there and found out that the, the power company does not allow any trees or bushes that grow more than 36 inches high in that area. So we, we revised the planting plan. Uh, and then after we revised it, we actually re recognized the fact that our dumpster pad uh, had a, uh, a screen on it. And we, we now have screened all four sides with slats. And we added since that some small bushes around the dumpster pad to try to do our best to enhance that. Uh, to protect the neighbors. Um, we have inserted on the uh, drawing number SP1, the anticipated start time of this project and the completion time to start time is we're starting, hoping to start it uh, yet this year. And we have a completion time of June next year. We've added a legend to the plans for clarity on SP1 um, the only thing that I'm, I seem to be missing, and I really thought I accomplished this late in the day after I, my third phone call or fourth phone call to the surveyor, was he did not provide me. I thought I had it. I mailed it to, uh, emailed it to Peter as soon as I got it today. And I'm looking, and the, the latest survey does not have the surveyor's stamp on it. So I'm going to ask you to, if you can, allow that to be. Uh, a condition for final approval. Um, we've got another letter dated November 4th, um, and which is from the town engineer. Um, and we've had, there's three items on that particular document. And one of them again was about the um, steel of the surveyor. Uh, and some monuments that had to be uh, 
shown on the drawing. And those monuments are shown on page uh, 16 and 17, uh, note 16 and 17 of my SP1. Uh, we also uh, moved the MS4 permit table to the cover sheet of the plan. And um, we had an error on the uh, detail showing the flow of the water at 0.6 CFS with a percentage sign after that, and that was incorrect. Uh, one last thing I'm going to bring to everybody's attention. Peter brought to my attention really uh, kind of late today that he was concerned, and I agree with him, he's concerned about the noise that the vacuums produce. We did send uh, the uh, calculated sound levels at various distances. And interesting, your zoning regulations actually have the, uh, the permitted sound decibel levels at different frequencies. And so you know this, I don't have the information um, at the different frequencies of what the sound levels would be. So what, what I'm gonna do is say that according to your regulations, we have to sound test it in the field uh, at the change of the zoning line. And I believe the zone line changes at the back of the railroad uh, track that's in our property. And I'm gonna say to you that we will make that test and we will have a witness to make sure it meets the criteria. If it doesn't, we will change the equipment. Um, I think that basically updates the plan from our previous conversations. And I'd like to ask the commission for questions. Yeah, um, is Mrs. Bianco okay with everything? From you and from Peter. I mean, she had a number of issues. You mentioned several of them, but is she satisfied at this point? She is on the meeting, so I, I defer to her to answer. I can't speak for her, so I okay. if you want her to hear from her yeah, now. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm still curious about any, any form, whether it's foliage or fencing, of privacy fencing on that east end of the property. And I, of course, am curious what that sound will be like with the vacuums. I don't know what the regulations are. Um, I don't know if I could hold them up so you could see them, uh, Megan, but I probably cannot show them to you. I don't know. If, I don't think it, but let me say to you, it's interesting because at different octave bands, they have different levels of sound. And I believe that the octave bands are the pitch of the sound, how high uh, of a pitch it is versus how low of a pitch it is. And it varies from uh, 72 decibels down to 32 decibels uh, in a, a residential zone. And again, I am not a sound expert, but the, there is a device that they make that can go out there and measure this. And I can only assure you that prior to us getting a certificate of occupancy, we'll make sure that it's done properly. And how about, thank you. How about with regard to um, privacy fencing screening? I mean, the grade of the land from where I live to up there, we have fencing on our end of our property. It doesn't matter, you know, that that piece of property is so much higher. Megan, I'm going to tell you that I'll give you an opinion here and I'd be very happy to consider your suggestions. If we put a fence up there, my opinion is the fence will actually be destroyed by any snow plowing and they will actually look worse than it does now. When I was out there, there were a lot of small bushes and and remember that the, the town, the, excuse me, the right of way limits us to a 36 inch high screening of any sort. And I'm gonna say that I think my hands are tied. I'd listen to suggestions that you may have or this commission may have and I'd be very, our, my client will be very cooperative in working with you in any, uh, basis that we can. Yeah, but uh, I hear both of you. But again, you go out there and look to the left side of the current dumpster and so forth. And you can see down on those condominiums. And I don't know. I can understand if you're dumping all your snow at that, right, at that point. And that's why it's open down toward the condominiums. And this may be her concern. Uh, and you say you don't want to put up anything there like shrubbery because it would be demolished by snow in the winter. 
Uh, let, me, let me clarify that. There is shrubbery there. If, yeah, but it's if, not. Wait, let, let, let me continue. If someone just asks us, we will be very cooperative in putting more shrubs. But let's all remember that the shrubs cannot be more than 36 inches high at maturity. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm going to say to you very openly that if Megan and I and somebody in the commission wants to get together and decide what we can do to help that, I'm not sure that this will benefit her in any sense at all, a 36 inch high at maturity tree. Uh, we're very happy to put some junipers in there, spreading junipers. They can't be uh, vertical junipers. They have to be spreading junipers or something like that. And I'd be very, very happy of considering that and, and, and volunteering for it. It's not at a high expense. I would rather not see a fence. I don't think a fence would be beneficial at all. I'm not sure I think a fence is, is the thing either. And, uh, but something that may little be opaque, some kind of shrubbery might be appropriate. Peter, can you uh, and or the town staff discuss this with both parties? What do you recommend? Well, the, the issue you is- You know where I mean, don't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the issue is uh, the power company uh, has limitations on the height of the vegetation so uh, any vegetation over three feet, um, they're not going to approve. Um, so yeah, but this is further back than the utility lines. No, it? it's right in the it's right in the utility uh, easement area. So um, oh, so thank all you. back yeah. of that property is. So the only um, I, I don't know even if it's an option. I think it has to be an option. Is is some sort of fence or some sort of a structure uh, to do that? So. Um, they're allowing light poles. They're allowing vacuum equipment. They're allowing dumpster screening in the easement area. I don't know why they wouldn't allow a fence of some sort. Um, I think you may also need the fence anyway because the vacuum equipment uh, exceeds the noise ordinance decibel levels uh, even at 150 feet away. So um, I, I don't want to see the vacuum equipment installed and then find out that it doesn't, you know, so I, I think we got to find a solution and the fence may help with the noise as well as the visual screening. I'm not sure what other options would uh, be available. Let me, let me volunteer something. Let's try to come to a resolution as soon as we prevail and hopefully tonight. I, I'd be very, very happy to install some kind of a, uh, let's call it a chain link fence. I think it'd be a, structurally it's probably the safest thing. I don't want a wooden fence with slats in it. I don't think it will hold up. A chain link fence with slats in it, perhaps brown if you'd like it to be, or green, and maybe maybe five feet high if it's allowed. I mean, if that's if that is something that the the commission would like to do, my answer is we want to be cooperative here. What I'd like to do is come to a conclusion on this and make uh, Megan and everybody happy as, as we can. Peter, is the uh, vacuum noise issue okay now? Is your part that, what no, they uh, based on the information submitted by the applicant, it is it is still an issue. Um, the right of way, the railroad right of way, is only 60 feet wide. Um, so at at 60 feet, the decibel levels, depending upon which equipment we're picking, um, are either 65, 70, or 64. And the limit during the daytime is 55. I'm not a noise expert either, but based on the literature submitted with the application, uh, we do have a conflict between the noise ordinance and the uh, noise generated by these vacuums. Can I just ask the uh, how does the how do the new vacuums and their locations compare to what's out there currently? And you know, put another way, will there be more or less of them and will they be same position or closer or farther away from those neighbors? I can answer that question for you. Um, pre presently, the vacuum cleaners are closer to the building. So they were, would be, they are now closer to the property line than they were. The new vacuum cleaners are a lot quieter, believe it or not, the vacuums are a lot quieter than the previous ones that were there. However, and I agree with Peter, and then I, I, this was brought to my attention later in the day today, I didn't have any chance to really investigate it. All I could say is 
I think that the commission and I us should agree that these vacuum cleaners must meet the decibel level, and and for me to my my job as an engineer to ensure it will. Me do we have to put that in as a condition on any approval? Yes, you would definitely have to do that. Okay, thank you. The other conditions, while you brought up the subject, um, there. I, I never did get the landscaping calculations from the applicant, but the um, proposed landscaping plan, I think makes the best of, of the existing situation, but because of the limitations imposed by the power company, they, do, they cannot meet our uh, landscaping requirements. So a waiver of our landscaping requirements is also required here. And then there are a few little technical things that the town engineer wanted. I, I received a memo from him late today, and there's just a few little things. Um, so I think if you throw in uh, another condition that the town engineer's conditions are met, um, those would be the three uh, main conditions that I would recommend you attach. Landscaping, noise from the vacuums, and then the town engineer's comments. One more comment from me. Uh, CLMP, um, I got Derek's with a question mark. I don't know what I meant by that, but uh, has that all been resolved? Uh, and everybody is happy? May I answer that question? The yeah. CLMP, CLMP question. investigated I that. what my question is, yeah. yeah. Well, they had an engineer go out there. He verified the facts and wrote me a letter saying that he's limited to 36 inches. I sent a copy of that letter to Peter, I believe. Okay. In file. They're happy then. Okay. Sorry. Do uh, any other commission members have questions at this point? Peter, do you have any uh, other concerns on the October 29th uh, memo or the November 4th memo? Do you believe everything's been satisfied? Yes. All of my other previous um, um, comments have either been um, responded to uh, satisfactory or the plans have been revised already to address my concerns. Excellent. Any, anyone else? Um, is there anyone in the public who either hasn't spoken at all or has spoken and has something more to say? Anyone in the public who would like to say anything further before we close the public comment? But la last call. Okay, hear, hearing no one, um, I just would ask Peter one clarification. So in order to address the noise issue, there's gotta be some form of fence or other barrier to, to deaden and mitigate the noise basically, or, or it could be, could it potentially be three foot high vegetation as well? It, or different equipment, there may be, you know, alternative equipment in the market that uh, has some you know, mechanisms that are going to, but they are vacuums, so they do, it will generate noise. So um, it's just that this particular uh, product selection uh, and the associated decibel levels exceed our noise ordinance, uh, also because of their location. Uh, many of them are situated on the back property line, basically as close to the neighbors as you could um, get it because of the site design. So some condition um, that provides some flexibility uh, for staff to work it out would probably be the, the way to would address that. Um, I don't know the answer to it right now. There are probably a couple of options, but uh, maybe a combination of new equipment and some screening, whether it's fencing or some other, you know, mechanism. Okay. Um, any other commission members with questions? And if not, uh, does the applicant have anything further, Mr. Borghese, that you'd like to say? Yeah, I, I might say I made a mistake. I indicated that the vacuums were closer to the building. I'm looking at the, uh, the survey plan, and there are uh, some vacuum stations right along the rear property line also, if presently. So uh, I, I erred in that statement. So uh, it, I, was, I was wrong in saying there was none along the property line there is. Um, I, I just want to, again, offer it. I don't know if someone in the commission can meet me out there. We could talk about a fence, the benefits, of, of some kind of fencing and the best way to do it, but I'm volunteering that we will be cooperative on that aspect. 
I will gladly meet anyone there. Um, Peter, do you have anything further before we close the hearing? No, I think, as I said, um, wa landscape waiver, uh, condition on the vacuum noise, and then the town engineer's comments being addressed. Okay, if, if, no, if no commission members have further questions, would somebody like to move to close the hearing? I'll make that motion, Joe. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Tony, second from George to close the hearing. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Would someone like to make a motion on the application itself? I'll take a stab at it, Joe. Okay. Just to, to approve application 2053-20Z for a special permit in accordance with our regulations for um, the addition of an oil change use and associated site improvements for 750 to 752 Salestine Highway. Um, inclusive of a survey stamp to be uh, um, applicable to the submission. Um, all things are satisfied with the October 29th and November 4th memos, subject to sound testing. Uh, our town engineer's last minute comments that Peter mentioned, a waiver of the landscaping plan and giving the um, support staff uh, some latitude on the buffer and the fence, be it fencing or shrubs. That cover it also here. Does that cover it? Good. Okay, is there a second? Second. George. Any uh, discussion or, or comment before we call the vote? Uh, one comment or clarification. Uh, uh, Tom Dean speaking. I am uh, just want to make sure that the, uh, uh, that the motion uh, covers or addresses uh, essentially both applications, that is the application for the special uh, use permit and also the uh, site plan and design review process. Um, do we need separate uh, motions for each of those uh, applications or does this motion cover both? Uh, Tom, I think the motion um, covers both. The special permit incorporates the um site plan and design review as part of part and parcel of that. Uh, that's my impression. I just want to make sure that the, the record uh, shows that. Okay. Um, if there are no further comments, um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? If I get the, the application motion carries 7-0 then, I believe. May I comment? Um, May I comment? Yes. Your staff is very cooperative and professional. I, I applaud it. Compared to most towns I deal in, I, my, my, my compliments to you. We, we appreciate that, Mr. Borghese. Thank you. And uh, if you, you know, contact uh, Peter and uh, you can uh, address the, the remaining uh, items. Uh, ho hopefully you can work that out uh, quickly, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we will move on to our next application, which is uh, actually an application. It's application number uh, 2054-20Z, Town of Wethersfield seeking a zoning text amendment in accordance with section 10.1.F of the Weathersfield zoning regulations for self storage facilities. Uh, I know we've uh, been aware that uh, Peter's been working on the regulations. Um, Peter, I, I, I'll ask you to present the application and, and before you do that, could you also just remind us of uh, what the current uh, moratorium uh, deadline is? Thanks, Joe. Um, just to refresh your memory, the uh, we are still in the moratorium. There's about a month left. I think December 5, the moratorium uh, expires. It was um, renewed um, a couple times just to give it the time to get to this point. Um, so there's about a month 
left in that moratorium. Okay. So, um, Joe, Thank I you. have, um, I asked uh, Mark Trahan, who is the chair of the Weathersfield Economic Development and Improvement Commission, as well as the chair of the Redevelopment Agency to join us. Um, as you are probably all aware, uh, much of this work uh, research was done under the guise of the Economic Development and Improvement Commission. Um, so I'll, um, I'll let Mark uh, start off. I do have a uh, PowerPoint presentation that summarizes the application, so I won't get into that right now. I'll let Mark um, say a few words and then I'll jump in and I'll be happy to answer uh, questions um, as we go through that set of slides. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, I wanna just share a few points uh, on the moratorium and the proposed self-storage regulations before you uh, this evening. The original thought on the moratorium was how do we protect any available parcels in town from becoming self-storage facilities? The EDIC and RDA initially did not have a favorable, favorable view of this type of development, and we were going to seek regulations to outright ban these facilities. As a matter of fact, a number of communities in Connecticut during this time has actually sought and instituted an outright ban on self-storage. But after some compelling information and some meetings, we decided to use the moratorium to dig deeper into the storage industry. And as we dug, we saw examples of facilities here in Connecticut, uh, which Pete can talk about, and across the United States where these facilities were being beautifully designed um, as mixed use uh, with some retail, some with office and some with residential. Um, so we changed course uh, and we decided to try to find a way to allow self-storage uh, with mixed use in mind, which has again been done successfully here in Connecticut and nationally. One of the goals during the moratorium was to become more proactive with the owners of these larger parcels here in Wethersfield. And our first focus was 1000 Salestine Highway as the commission knows, this property has been vacant for 20 plus years, and we believe could be a potential jewel uh, on the South Seine Highway, uh, very similar to what's happened at the Borden, et cetera. We've got some great momentum. Um, there have been some close calls on 1000 South Seine with regards to possible developments. The most recent history um, uh, uh, was Ashley Furniture, and there's been others. Um, I reached out. Uh, personally to Mr. Fernaro, who is the uh, owner of 1000 Salestine Highway, who is with us tonight. Um, and we had some excellent dialogue and we began to participate in meetings with Mr. Fernaro, town staff and potential developers to discuss how the town could help aid in, de in the development of that property. And we look forward to more conversations uh, with Mr. Fernaro. Our goal with the proposed self-storage regulations is to provide a framework for self-storage to offer a beautiful, well-designed facility while also adding other opportunities for retail, medical, office, residential, uh, all for the betterment of the citizens here of Wethersfield. Um, and again, we look forward to working with all the owners of these larger parcels here in town. Um, so our initial thought with the moratorium was how do we, how do we figure out a way to maybe uh, to ban these um, and with some careful consideration and a lot of thoughtful work on behalf of the EDIC and RDA, especially Peter, um, we're with you at this point tonight. So Pete, I'll, I'll segue back over to you. Sure, let me um, <clears throat> see if the technology allows us to share uh, this PowerPoint here. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. yep. I can see it. Thanks. Okay, um, so once again, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present uh, these proposed regulations. Um, in quick summary, this is application 2054-20-Z. Uh, we're proposing uh, zoning regulation amendments uh, to several sections of your regulations. Section 6 point, I'm sorry, section 2.3. Uh, we've got a series of new definitions. Section 5.2H3, H3, which is our uh, use table. Um, so the concept will be, we will continue to allow self-storage facilities uh, via the special permit process in the RC and the business park zones. Uh, we've added uh, section 5.12, which has a series of standards 
new standards for self-storage facilities. And then lastly, we've added uh, a new parking requirement. Um, uh, we do not have a self-storage uh, parking requirement in our present regulations. Uh, these are the two new definitions we are proposing. We're proposing a definition of obviously self-storage facility. We do not presently have uh, such a definition in the regulations. And we're also proposing a definition for mixed use development uh, because the uh, regulations as drafted uh, would integrate mixed use development into new self-storage facilities. Uh, in summary, uh, these are uh, the provisions, the new provisions of section 5.12. Um, the regulations require that these buildings now be uh, designed as multi-story buildings. I'll, I'll, we'll get into the, the logic behind that uh, in a moment. Uh, we are requiring a mixed use component. Uh, if it's a single uh, building uh, for self-storage, 50% of the ground floor has to be uh, dedicated to some other non-self-storage use. Uh, if it's a, a project with multiple buildings, then uh, in total, 25% of uh, all of the square footage must be uh, dedicated to some other non-self-storage use. Uh, we've, we've put in a 5,000 foot separation distance. I'll get into that uh, also in a little bit. Uh, we're, we are putting some standards in there that no other commercial activity can occur within the self-storage facility. Uh, we are allowing uh, these facilities to have a store, for example, which sells boxes, um, uh, and other equipment related to the self-storage business uh, in, in these projects. Uh, we're not allowing electrical or plumbing uh, within the self-storage units to avoid the potential use for some other commercial purpose. Uh, we are putting some standards in there that would allow some outside storage areas. We are establishing some new building design requirements or in essence, architectural requirements. Uh, we are requiring um, uh, some standards for the loading areas and we are requiring some screening and fence uh, language. Uh, we are uh, including some provisions that um, allow for uh, uh, exceptions to the overall site building coverage and the height of the building if the commission uh, feels that is warranted. And then lastly, we've got some language in there that would relate specifically to the existing self-storage facilities uh, that already exist in town. Those would be considered uh, non-conforming uses. However, there is language in there that would allow them if they wanted to, to come in to the Planning and Zoning Commission and expand if, um, if appropriate. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have some uh, separating distance requirements as drafted. Uh, the separating distance between self-storage facilities is 5,000 feet. Uh, this is an overlay of our present zoning map. So you can see on the left, uh, we have three self-storage facilities uh, up on the, uh, I'm sorry, two self-storage facilities up on the Berlin Turnpike or off the Berlin Turnpike. The yellow uh, radius is 2,500 feet. The blue radius is the 5,000 foot standard. So it gives you an idea of what properties would be impacted by the separating distance. On the right, uh, you can see uh, the 132 Silas Dean Highway location. And once again, the yellow is 2,500 foot separating distance and the blue is the 5,000 uh, foot separating distance. Uh, we, are, we have also put a uh, parking requirement. Uh, these uses do not uh, require much in the way of parking. This, this may be um, uh, a, a subject we can discuss further. This may be excessive uh, based on some other regulations that we've seen. But nevertheless, the bottom line is this type of use does not require much in the way of parking. Um, these are um, our existing regulations. This is a summary of our existing regulations. As I mentioned at the beginning, we presently allow storage facilities with interior and exterior access to storage bays. We do not have a definition of, of what those uses are. Uh, they are permitted by special permit. They are permitted in the RC and the BP zone. We do not have a parking standard and we do not have specific uh, use regulations for this type of uh, land use. So that's just a quick refresher on our present regulations. Uh, this slide gives you a little bit of a summary of the work that was done 
uh, by the EDIC and the RDA. Uh, you can see lots of research. Uh, I'll get into some of the details in the next few slides, but it gives you a quick uh, summary of the work done uh, over the last year uh, to put these regulations together. Part of that was to research and inventory our existing self-storage facilities. There are presently three facilities here in town. Um, 132 Silas Dean Highway, which is on the north end of the Silas Dean Highway. You can see the photo on the right-hand side. Uh, that's an 80, uh, roughly a 90,000 square foot building. There are 723 storage units in the building. Uh, it was built back in 2002. And interestingly enough, it presently has an assessed, assessed value of nearly $6 million. So these facilities uh, at this level do contribute uh, to the town's tax base in a, in a pretty significant way. Uh, the other two facilities in town, uh, one at 50 Oleson Road and the other at 1884 Berlin Turnpike, I guess are what you would probably normally refer to as the mini storage style. These are the one story with the garage doors where you would drive right up to the garage doors. Um, the 50 Oleson Road has 119 units. That's over 100,000 square feet of storage space built in 1987. And once again, has an assessed value of, of over $6 million. Uh, the smallest facility in town is the uh, facility at 1884 Berlin Turnpike. It's only a little bit over 10,000 square feet, only has 22 units, and has a, a assessed value of a little bit under $400,000. Um, we did take a look uh, and uh, analyzed what's going on in the region in terms of self-storage facilities. So our neighboring towns, this is a quick breakdown of how many other facilities you will find uh, in Hartford, Newington, East Hartford, West Hartford, Glastonbury, and Rocky Hill. So um, in terms of what's going on in the marketplace, uh, I have received several inquiries uh, I, and I still have received those recently. So there's, there is a level of interest. Uh, so there clearly is a level of market demand that is, being, is not being met right now. So you should be aware of that. Um, historically, uh, or at least in the last few decades, this storage industry is um, a rapidly growing uh, a real estate component of the market. Um, we did take a look at what the storage industry standards are for a community uh, such as Weathersfield. They typically use a three mile radius because their customers uh, uh, are usually local. Um, so using that seven to eight square foot per person demand, uh, that puts Weathersfield demand at a little bit over 200,000 square feet. And interest interestingly enough, our three existing facilities total 216,000 square feet. So we're right in line with uh, those uh, national standards. Uh, I wanted to also remind you, we did approve another facility a couple of years back up on Arrow Road, which has not yet been built and the permit is still valid. So you should be aware of that. Um, in terms of what's going on in Connecticut, uh, we did take a look at some of the statistics for that. In 2008, over a million square feet uh, was built in Connecticut. And in 2017, uh, a little bit over 600,000 uh, was constructed in Connecticut. I could not find the numbers for 2019 and obviously 2020 is not done yet. So, um, and then lastly, um, the market uh, trends indicate that the number of households uh, presently renting self-storage units across the country is at an all-time high of uh, nearly 13 and a half million um, people, households. We did take a look at the regulations in place um, in other communities in Connecticut. Um, this particular subject, self-storage, has uh, been a bit of a controversy in, in several communities in Connecticut recently, namely Hartford, uh, Milford, and New Haven. All of them has, have recently gone through a similar process to what we're doing today. Uh, and at the end of the day, all of them decided to regulate this use through the use of uh, design guidelines and design districts. So it's a very similar concept to what uh, we are proposing here tonight. Some of the other uh, examples, Plainville has a three acre minimum for these, this type of development. They also have separating distances. They require architectural standards. Uh, they have their own specific parking requirements. Um, so this just gives you a flavor uh, for what some of the other uh, communities um, are also doing in terms of the regulation of self-storage facilities. Uh, interestingly as well, 
Uh, Berlin uh, was recently contacted by a developer. They went in before their planning and zoning commission in a similar pre-application review format. And that particular developer was approaching them uh, to develop mixed use self-storage regulations so that they could add some self-storage to an existing uh, commercial strip. We also looked uh, across the country uh, to get a flavor for what's going on. Uh, we looked at some regulations in Florida, some in Virginia, some on the, on the West Coast in Washington. Um, many of them have very, very detailed standards uh, for architectural review. Some of them get into the specifics of how, mu how, many, how much glass window facade sh should be included. Uh, many have multi-story requirements and many are also going towards the mixed use uh, design philosophy. Some of the emerging trends, I think this is the, almost the second to last slide. Uh, some of the emerging trends that are going on, um, not surprisingly, self-storage uh, facilities are under increasing scrutiny from local communities. We found many, many stories uh, about controversies regarding self-storage and communities not necessarily uh, being uh, welcoming uh, to this type of development. Uh, this is a very resilient uh, industry. Even during the pandemic, uh, the, the industry is still doing pretty well. Um, the next generation of self-storage facilities are looking at retail locations, um, even uh, near multifamily buildings, uh, rather than the traditional industrial park or heavy commercial locations. So many of them are looking at corridors similar to the Silas Dean Highway. Um, they are, uh, as you will see in a couple of upcoming slides, these facilities tend to have a much, uh, much greater aesthetic appeal to communities than they did in the past. They tend to look more like retail or office buildings, and even uh, some of them have a multifamily uh, flavor to them. Um, there, are, there is a trend toward, towards mixed use, as I mentioned earlier, where uh, self-storage is combined with either multifamily or commercial. And then, uh, however, there are some new questions being raised about that type of development and issue, potential issues with financing them. And then lastly, uh, there is a question about whether uh, the market is going to be uh, oversupplied with this type of development. As Mark mentioned, uh, as part of the EDIC's effort, they asked me to go out and uh, visit uh, some recently developed self-storage facilities elsewhere in Connecticut. So the next few slides are just some quick visuals of some of those projects. Uh, first one here is Ridgefield self-storage. So this is a th actually a three-story uh, structure in the front. There's a lower level around the side here. Um, and this, uh, these upper levels are actually apartments. So this is a combination of apartments and self-storage. And adjacent to this building by the same developer is a, an age-restricted residential community that was done at the same time as this building was constructed. And as you can see, uh, the aesthetics of these uh, projects have uh, vastly improved from what you would traditionally have seen. On the right uh, in Milford is uh, a self-storage facility called The Lockup. This has a combination of interior units. And then on the side, there are the traditional garage doors. But once again, lots of glass, brick. Um, the facade is uh, broken up uh, to be attractive. But once again, another example of a three-story uh, self-storage. This is all self-storage. This is not a mixed use. Uh, we also went down to Norwalk. This is a project called Secure Self-Storage. Uh, once again, a lot of glass. Looks like a, if you didn't see the sign, it could be an office building. Um, additionally, on this property, it, it shares another uh, development, and this is a multifamily apartment building on the same property. So this is another example of uh, self-storage combined with uh, multifamily development uh, in support of the mixed uh, use trend. I think the next slide is my last. So I just put a, uh, a slide here together uh, just to give you the pros and the cons of this type of development. Uh, self-storage does not generate much in the way of traffic demand. Um, they're relatively uh, inexpensive to build and also to operate. Uh, as I say, they're, they're not many there are not many uh, employees or jobs generated. Uh, however, they can generate, as you saw, 
substantial property taxes to a community. So that's certainly a pro. Um, they do not put burdens on municipal services. Don't burden the local schools. There's not a lot of uh, calls to these facilities from emergency personnel. So they do not put that kind of demand on a, on a community. Um, they are very flexible in their design approach. So they are often able to develop underused sites uh, and design the site in a creative way to fit in. Uh, they do not, as I said earlier, require much in the way of parking and they do not require a heavy demand on utility use. Some of the things that could be viewed as negatives about self-storage, um, they're not always the highest and best use of property. Uh, there are other uses that uh, one would consider maybe a, a better use. Uh, they don't uh, create many jobs. Uh, they do not tend to spur additional nearby uh, development. Uh, as I said earlier, there is in many communities uh, a question about uh, how much the market uh, can support. Um, historically, um, uh, as we said earlier, they may not uh, have been designed with the greatest character and aesthetics, but I think we've seen that trend change. Uh, they do take up uh, a quite, a, quite a bit of square footage, as you can see from the size of some of these buildings. And I don't need to remind you that Weathersfield has uh, very limited uh, uh, developable land left. And then um, uh, one of the arguments against them is they do not contribute uh, to the economic vibrancy and activity. There's not a lot of people there. It doesn't generate a lot of pedestrian activity. It doesn't generate a lot of traffic uh, that might otherwise uh, support uh, the surrounding um, business community. So that's the uh, last slide. I'd be happy to uh, answer uh, any any questions uh, on any of that. I know I cranked through that pretty quickly, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Let me have uh, questions for Peter at this point. Yes, I have a couple of questions if possible. Uh, Peter, uh, one of the issues that uh, was uh, that I noticed uh, arose in the uh, comment submitted by the owner of uh, 1000 Silas Dean Highway, which is the, uh, the three-story uh, height requirement. Uh, can you go into that uh, a bit and, and the rationale for uh, having that requirement uh, built into the proposed regs? So it goes back to the, the fact that we have very uh, limited uh, land available for, for future economic development. So the, the, the idea behind that was to maximize uh, the development potential of our uh, limited remaining uh, properties in town. And as you can see from some of the slides, it does uh, appear to be the trend uh, in many other communities. Each one of those projects that I showed you were either three or four stories. So uh, for both of those reasons, the Economic Development Commission felt uh, that it uh, warranted a higher standard. Now, you, you do raise a good point if, um, and Mr. Funaro, I believe is on the call, so I'll let him uh, answer that for him for himself, but um, uh, it would create a problem uh, for uh, the redevelopment of 1000 Silas Dean Highway if that were to be uh, converted to self storage. So you definitely have uh, a point there that we probably need to discuss um, as to whether there needs to be some flexibility or, or not. So anybody else uh, with, with questions at this point before we go to the yeah, Joe, um, do you, do you, are you requiring mixed use or can it be just storage facility? It, it could be a, a storage facility, but some other component of the property would have to have another use. So uh, if it was just to be a self-storage facility, um, it would not meet the, these new regulations. Are you putting in a minimum requirement for the other use, like 10% or something? Yeah, we have, we have depending on the style of development, it's either 50% or 25%, 50% of the first floor or 25% of the total project. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Um, Peter, what the rendering on page 40 of a thousand South Scene Highway, um, what is that in reference to? I'll let Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Funaro, uh, you, so you're, okay. you're referring to Mr. Funaro's um, letter? Yeah. I'll, I'll let him okay. explain that when we, when we get to that. Thank you. Um, Peter, I had just a couple of quick um, questions following up on a couple of the points that, that you made. Um, and, and some of those pictures that you showed, which were very helpful of other developed buildings. Um, you know, so one, one observation is I thought that the ones that, you know, don't have the typical garage doors as a very visible feature, but look, you know, more like a different type of building are very, very nice. And, and I realized this would be a special permit use. So we have a certain degree of control, but I was just wondering in any of the other Connecticut towns or elsewhere that you've looked at, do they impose any limitations, for example, that you can't have the, the garage doors on the street side of the building such that it's visible from the street or otherwise limiting where you can do that or how much you know you can do it of the of the building perimeter? So if um, I, I, pulled up, I pulled up the photos again. So this um, Ridgefield self-storage, you can't uh, see it, but there's a screen fence right here. There's a lower level with a driveway around the side. And that entire lower level has a series of garage doors. Um, you can't see that from the street. And there's no neighboring um, property that could see those as well. So they... Uh, integrated that design uh, pretty well into this um, facility. The lockup in Milford has a series of uh, garage doors on the ground level on the side of the building. And it faces a, I think it's a McDonald's or something like that. So you can't, you can't really see those or you can't see them much from the street. Uh, from the side parking lot, you can. Um, the Norwalk has a series of large uh, garage doors along the back side where you go into the building um, to access your unit. You, there's, no, there's not a series of garage doors. They are just large industrial overhead doors. So um, you make a good point that um, these designs have incorporated those doors to be not uh, visible from the main front facade of the building. They have to be incorporated into uh, and or screened. And I guess my question is, do you, do you just rely on the fact that you're in a special permit process or do you actually put language in that, you know, tries, tries to regulate it? I realize, you know, if you say that, then you're to some degree possibly tying your, your hands, but I guess just something to, to think about um, whether, whether it, is, is needed or not, I guess, for people to think about. Um, another question I guess I had is on the, on the parking. Um, I, by my quick math, um, were, you, were you proposing a one space per 50 storage units? Is that what I saw on one of your slides? Yes. Yep. So I guess if you just compare it to the big one on the corner of Jordan Lane and the Silas Dean Highway with 700 and 23 units, I think that would be about 15 spaces for the storage part and another space for the office, probably 16 spaces total. And if you, if you divide the 88,000 square feet by the number of spaces, I think it comes out to about one space per 5,500 square feet of floor area, something like that, which to me seems reasonable just because I think those are the kinds of uses where people are not all there at the same time and they're not necessarily there on a very frequent basis. And uh, I just assume not have, you know, surface parking as the prominent feature if we're trying to have this, this mixed use look. Um, I guess maybe it becomes a little bit more, you know, if you're doing it based on number of units versus square footage, I guess I'm, I'm not sure which is better, although I'm guessing that if anything, probably there aren't, you know, super duper size units and there's more, you know, modest 
size unit. So if anything, maybe the per unit, I don't know, does the per unit standard possibly come out to require you know more rather than less? But again, just another another question to to um, think about. You, you also indicated you know no minimum lot size here, although I think you said one other place at least had that. So does that mean we'd just be reverting to whatever the underlying minimum is in the particular zoning district, which I assume is probably pretty small in those two zoning districts in town. Um, so, you know, I guess the only other, again, throwing out there whether we care about a minimum lot size or if we, the other way to do it, I guess, would be to have a minimum square footage of the storage or a, or a maximum, which would be another way of either requiring it to sort of be a larger site or a smaller site. But again, I realize you could be creating conflicts with your mixed use goals. So I, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the answer is on that. And I guess my final question or comment would be, again, it gets back to something I said earlier, I, I think in part, are we covered and comfortable with the normal special permit standards or should there be any additional standards set forth you know for this type of use in addition to those other standards so those are those are my thoughts um but i but i just thank you i mean it's a very thorough thorough job and 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 very helpful what you put together peter um and and mark as well thank you is there anybody else on the uh commission yeah i would uh, no um peter is there is there really a need for the, what's the distance requirement? You can't have two of these near each other, for example. So um, let me go to the slide that illustrates that. So uh, we do have in this in this regulation a, a 5,000 square foot separating distance. So yeah. that would basically, if you look at the uh, Berlin Turnpike facilities, would basically eliminate the opportunity for anybody to put another facility uh, anywhere in the general proximity of um, Berlin Turnpike is out. Berlin Turnpike, except, uh, I, yeah, except for a very small business park property way up almost uh, in Hartford, um, and then on the, it doesn't have this uh, uh, that significant an impact on the. Silas Dean Highway, um, because the properties that are zoned regional commercial and business park are all primarily outside of the 5,000 um, square foot separating distance. So you can't go really south on the Silas Dean, basically, is what you're doing here, right? You would only be able to go uh, south on the Silas Dean oh, Highway. So at the bottom right, where that blue uh, zoning district is that's the um, um, regional commercial so that would be the only area um, except for a couple of scattered business park sites that uh, the use would be permitted in and you don't want them close to each other for instance let's say the uh, shopping center up at the north end of the Silestine Highway across from our existing uh, location uh, you wouldn't want them close to each other. Even I, if I think, going to I think there's a there's a theory one way or the other that you know maybe you don't want them clustering, um, and and you want them, you know, spread out throughout the community. So I, it, um, it just seems to, it seemed to be a common theme in many of the regulations. I I, I but I have to tell you that the five thousand foot separating distance is at the uh, extreme end of, of what I saw. Many were only a thousand or 1500. So 5,000, that's why I also provided you with a 2,500 foot illustration to see what that, uh, what that would do. That would certainly open up other properties uh, for this type of use um, on the Berlin Turnpike as well as the Silestine Highway. I don't like the distance that's okay. too far. Yep. I, and, and it precludes a lot of potential use of this type thing. Because it looks to me like high quality. And uh, 
I've said that from the beginning and I still say it. Um, what did you model the regulation you proposed after? Did you look at several and combine all your best thoughts in it or did you, did you find one that was pretty good and uh, just added to it? No, I, I, I would say this is a hybrid of many, um, okay. many, many communities. However, there were many common uh, themes uh, throughout that we, um, you know, borrowed. So I would not, I would not uh, hold any particular one up as a, as an example. Okay. Thank you. That's sure. my comments. I have uh, one comment uh, and, and one question. Uh, the comment goes first, uh, along with what George was indicating. I, I tend to think that the 5,000-foot uh, uh, radius uh, distance requirement is a bit excessive. I, I would tend to favor a 2,500-foot uh, uh, radius. Uh, I think that, that may be more reasonable. Uh, particularly if uh, the commission does its, its job in terms of uh, reviewing future applications and uh, uh, is supportive of only uh, high quality applications for this type of development. Uh, my question has to do with, with the topic that's not addressed in the regulations and it may not be appropriate for uh, for placement in, in land use regulations, but I notice that these regulations do not mention any standards or requirements or limitations regarding the contents of what, uh, what is eligible to be stored within the self-storage units. For example, uh, no, no requirements or regulations dealing with combustible materials, explosive materials, or biohazardous materials. And I just wonder if Peter could uh, comment uh, with regards to the absence of uh, those kinds of regulations or restrictions uh, as it relates to uh, potential contents of, uh, the, uh, of what could be placed into uh, self-storage uh, units. Thanks, Tom. Um we are, we are re uh, regulating uh, activities um, in these units um, or prohibiting certain activities. Uh, I did, and many of the regulations that I used or reviewed do include prohibitions on, on the things that you mentioned, but after conferring with the fire marshal, uh, he felt that the uh, fire code um, and uh, the provisions that many of the operators uh, uh, have in their in their rules, regulations, and policies uh, would cover uh, those particulars. So uh, I shied away from uh, incorporating those because anytime you try and you know come up with a list of prohibitions, you're bound to have missed something. Um, and uh, as I say, the fire marshal seemed to feel confident that we didn't. Um, didn't need to do that. But as I say, there are communities that have done that. So I, I kind of defer to you guys if you want to, if you want to go down that road. Peter, also on the uh, document uh, dated September 24th and the regulations item E on that, as you mentioned, does discuss certain things that cannot be used for people can't live in them. It can't be an office or retail workshop studios, uh, rehearsal areas, manufacturing, fabrication, Etc. And I also recall in a conversation, I think it might have been with Mr. Fanaro, that the industry itself is pretty self regulating on what could go into these um, uh, particular um, uh, units as well. Yeah, one more, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, this mixed use or required residential bothers me because I could see proposals that wouldn't provide for it. Um, and would you, somebody came in and without that, you would send them away or go away and come back with it? If, if we adopted a regulation like that? Uh, George, to answer your question, yes. Um, if they proposed only 
self storage the way this regulation is written they would not be permitted under this regulation but some commercial but they have to have a residential aspect to it no they ha they can have a residential or a commercial or a commercial so a mix with the, self the other or both right doesn't uh, have to be just residential one of those would do okay yes, one Thank of them you. would do yep any uh any other questions from the commission? Hey, 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 this is David Drake. I, I was, I kind of agree with George on that 5,000 uh, feet distance. I think it's maybe a little bit too much too. But based on what you have right here, basically you can skip all that stuff and just say you allow two more in town. That's it, right? Yeah, something like that. You couldn't fit three more anywhere. Yeah, if you, if you actually, if you added, a, if you added one, for example, at a, Thousand Silestein Highway, for example, that would probably uh, be the limit because that would. That's right. So again, we have all these regulations, which is just yeah. to say we're going to allow one more in town. Whoever comes up with the best deal, that's it. So we're doing a lot of regulations for that. Yeah, Dave, I um, I don't know the definitive answer to this, but I I am hesitant in terms of establishing a maximum number of any type of use i think no 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 that's not what i want to do my, my yeah. point is the five thousand square feet basically says you're allowing two more in town maybe as, as a practical matter i guess right yeah that's why i say i think the five thousand may be a lot for me it's maybe a lot i don't know if i want to go real short but maybe five thousand is a lot that's yeah. a mile i mean you know what i mean it's a mile but I'm, I'm either way. I, I'm not really pro these type of things. But uh, based on what you have now, you could you probably be able to just fit two more in, maybe if not just one. That's it. Like Dave, but you got to remember that Weathersfield isn't the biggest community around. We're not a new town, or no, no, no. I agree yeah. with you. I'm, sorry, I'm trying to say is though, no. based on the five thousand. No, what are you saying? You're more. right. We don't have a lot of land yeah. as well as yeah. being highly developed. That's why I say I don't know if it'd bother me by making that a little shorter than five thousand. No. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. A little too much. Peter, can we put a clause in that you have to follow the developer has to follow the Connecticut laws for self storage facilities? The present code for self storage facilities, because I'm looking at them right now online. There's ones under the Department of Consumer Consumer Protection, Department of Motor Vehicles. Office of Legislative Research and Department of Revenue Services have laws related to safe to um, self storage units in Connecticut. Can we just put a general clause in that, uh, like you do with building codes, that you must follow the present codes? Well, I, I, we didn't put the we didn't put that in here because it's assumed yeah. it's the law of the land. So uh, all okay. of those things obviously apply without the need to actually, you know, okay. include them. So. Um, yeah, I think it's one of those things that uh, goes without saying that they have to comply with every other law, code, et cetera, that regulates the activity. Okay. Peter, is the uh, is a is a residential and a mixed use building allowed? Uh, it's allowed in both of the two business zones that we're talking about, I assume. Yes, it would be uh, the same in both. I mean, is it already? Is residential already allowed in both of those business zones today? Uh, mixed mixed use. Uh, let me just confirm that by taking a peek at our mixed use regulations. So, um, RC. Yeah. So presently, under the mixed. Uh, residential and commercial uses, uh, village business, town center, general business, RC, um, business park does not permit mixed use. So that's a, a good point you raise that this would potentially, or I shouldn't say potentially, it would open the door to do that in a business park and it, where it's not allowed under our mixed use regulations. So, so question whether we whether we want that is what you're yeah, i guess i might I'm, that's a good point i might have to think about that a little bit yeah that's a good catch yeah if you take something like the borden it was the borden only allowable 
by having retail on the bottom as opposed to just a straight apartment building or can you do 100 yes. percent housing no that was a that was under the mixed use regulations in the uh, rc rc zone so okay okay peter i want to i want to compliment the efforts that you and mark have done also um just to remind the commission of the six million dollar value of assessment and brings in almost a quarter of a million dollars in property taxes. That's pretty significant in the indirect. If you put sprinklers in, HVAC, electrical and plumbing, that just enhances the value a little bit further. I've talked to Fauna a little bit about this and uh, both of our careers have uh, encroached on appraising and putting assessed values on a lot of facilities like this. Um, the mixed use and the indirect is a, an example like the Borden when you might have 40, 50, 60% occupancy and other apartments that are on the South Street Highway this is a plum to uh, keep the occupancy even higher, allows people to be really close to where they're living and occupying the other apartment buildings. So I think uh, you've done a good job and uh, it's, it's just timely. Uh, we've had a couple in New Haven County and Fairfield County that actually included a couple apartments for the keepers of these 24-7 uh, facilities and it's worked out really well. They're modern, they're green friendly and, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's timely. So I think you've done a great job, thank you. Before I forget, let me just ask if there's any members of the public here tonight who would like to speak on this application. Good evening, any gentlemen. Members? I'm A.J. Fanaro, and I own 1000 Silas Dean. How are you all? Fine, thank you. Welcome. So if I may, I'll give you all. First of all, have you all received and read uh, my two page letter to the commission? I presume so, I'll just presume so. Uh, Peter, has that been distributed? It was in their packet, yes. One of the members was asking questions earlier about it. Okay, okay. so I can give you some highlights from that, but, and I apologize for some reason, the video is not working, but uh, would love to be seen as well, because I can see you all just fine. I have owned this building for quite some time, as Mark mentioned, uh, I will say over the last 10 years that I have been working, and Peter can attest to this, that I've been working uh, in cooperation with the town uh, and trying to accommodate what the town's preferences were with this site. And although there was never any uh, discussion about not permitting self-storage at this site, there was a preference. And so, just to be a good citizen, I was trying to accommodate that. Even to the extent when there was uh, the Ashley's furniture, which uh, Mark, that wasn't recently, that was about five or more years ago uh, when uh, Paul Montanieri was the, uh, was the acting mayor. Uh, I even joined in a press conference, even though we only had a letter of intent uh, at that time. Um, but there's been a series, uh, I can go on and on and on, different types of potential opportunities that were presented to me by the town, but every single one has fallen apart. Nothing other than self-storage has had an, a viable and real interest in this particular site. And so it has remained vacant, uh, you know, in its existing form. And so uh, I got to a point, I would say, oh, maybe a year and a half ago, when it just seemed like we're trying to force the market to be something that it's not. And this has, as you all know, Silas Dean has, it's a wonderful location, has great access to Interstate 91 and high traffic count. And uh, there is significant market demand for self-storage. And every time we list this property, that seems to be the overwhelming majority of interest that we get. And so uh, back in last, last summer, a year ago, summer, I decided that, look, I got to just let the market be what it wants to be. And I did accept an offer, uh, a cash offer. And we were just a few weeks away from, you know, pretty close to closing. And then the moratorium was put into place. Uh, first, it was six months, then renewed, and then I guess renewed again. And so here we are. 
Uh, I'm very pleased. And Peter, I, if you ever uh, want a second career, I have some self-storage developers that would surely hire you because of all the detailed work that you've done on this. So, I'll do that as my, uh, my retirement gig. How's yeah. that? <laughs> and I'm not a self-storage person. I, I, do know, I, I do know a lot about finance, though, because I have a, a company of 28 years that I founded after I left my Wall Street career. And we are very passionate about financing uh, the improvement of properties uh, all around the country. Uh, so I can give you a little bit of comment about how hard it is to finance uh, mixed use and the challenges with, with that. But all that being said, I did put it under contract and let's let the market be what it is. But after all the work that Peter and Mark did, uh, I guess I'm pleased, <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of <coughs> you're coming around to, to recognizing what I've been saying uh, and what I've learned from the self storage industry. I'm not a self storage expert, but <clears throat> one of the gentlemen had asked about what that photo is or that rendering is uh, in, the, in the memorandum. And that was one of the proposed developments. That was a rendering done by a, uh, an architect in New Jersey. So that was actual, that was an actual transaction. Uh, they offered a uh, million eight hundred fifty thousand dollars you know for that uh, and and there's others that one happens to be a little more modern design in terms of being having a drive-through because uh, they felt in the harsh climates of the winter that was their you know competitive advantage um, but there's lots of designs but I guess I'm pleased that you're coming around to recognizing that self-storage the days of orange doors is long past and <clears throat> there can be a lot done and beautiful and accommodating and how it <clears throat> integrates with the community and, and, and so forth. And so I have no opposition whatsoever with regard to design reviews, architectural reviews, making something that is aesthetically pleasing and blends in very nicely with the community and the, you know, and the streetscape and, and, and all that. What I do have is a major problem with <clears throat> mandating that at the regulation level as to what that has to be in the level of detail with regard to those, those mandates. Uh, just one example would be, you know, three stories. Well, it, it's great that we want to increase, you know, the tax base and everything and maximize the use of that particular three and a half acres. Okay, but the market demand is going to demand that, right? You know, right now, I'm financing uh, a 400 unit project down in New Haven that we did and it was transformational. It's a 13 acre site. Okay, but we're actually got it approved for 900 units, but we can't do 900 units. The market won't, won't take the 900 units. So I think we've got to be practical about it. Uh, I, did, uh, I did show the proposed uh, regulations, the amendments to the regulations to a number of self storage operators and uh, I'll be polite, <laughs> but they just said that it's totally impractical. Uh, you know, forget about using your building to do any sort of conversion. And we're not in the business of trying to figure out whether or not we got to find retail, which retail, we all know what challenges are retail right now. We're not apartment builders. We're not this or that. Okay, we're in the self storage business. You know, tell us what you want it to look like and we can accommodate that but we're in the self storage business. And you know, I, I do think that if we just wanna look at some of the examples uh, that were presented here tonight, uh, you can take, for example, the Milford one. Milford, that is only self storage. And I don't see, unless you all do, I don't see anything that's aesthetically displeasing with that at all. To the contrary, it's a beautiful facility and I'd be very proud to have that you know, in, in my town and my community. You know, the demand is there. Okay, there is tremendous need in, in uh, Weathersfield for, uh, for, for, this type of, uh, for this type of use. And, and even if you take like a facility like the Richfield one, well, Richfield is primarily an apartment complex that just happened to have a downgrading. And so as it goes downgrade, we might as well take advantage of that extra space. So let's build some store, self storage in it. Okay, and I, I think that if, if we are now over the hurdle, if we're over the hurdle of we're going to permit self-storage use, okay, and I think 
The only negative that I see with self-storage is that, to the extent there is a negative, is that, as Peter had mentioned, is the number of job creation. And that's when the former mayors were telling me, well, we want to create more jobs and so on and so forth. So I tried to be accommodative. But the highest and best use of this site, at least what we have seen to date in terms of all the interest, has been self-storage interest. Okay. And so I think we got to just say, hey, let the market be the market. And we can have architectural review and design reviews and make sure it looks aesthetically pleasing. But then let's just do that, you know, at the commission level when it when the proposals come in. But to number one, to mandate that it's mixed use and having 50% of the building be another use other than self-storage, uh, you're basically saying with my property, you're saying that that building has to be taken down 100%. There's no way that anybody's going to come in and do 50% mixed use uh, on that parcel. It, it's just not going to happen. All right. So, and, you know, a building like that, you know, if that building itself goes up new, that's about 70, $75 a square foot. And, you know, even if you say, even though there's more when it goes down grain below, but if it's an 80,000, that's a $6 million cost to, to reconstruct that. So, and then back out, of course, it needs a lot of improvements and everything, but that's taking a lot away from the project in terms of, you know, adding so much more cost to it that it just makes it really impractical to use. So my question really is, you know, if we're past the point now, you know, within the last year and, and message I was trying to convey initially, and I would have been happy prior to this moratorium to have demonstrated this, and I could have shown you some of these designs, but we are where we are, right? And so if we're past the point of, okay, self-storage is something we would accept uh, and provided that these types of designs, you know, and they look nice and they're appealing, then why can't we just leave it to that without trying to force the market to say it has to be a mixed use, it has to be this percent and that percent, uh, you know, and that's going to make it very impractical to, it, it'll make it impossible to use this existing structure, you know, number one. And secondarily, I've also asked these developers, I said, well, are you interested if, uh, you know, if we took down the building and then we put up a self storage, but we put something else with it. And I said, well, where are we going to find this something else? You know, that's just not what our business is. And so either way, I think we're making it very, very impractical for somebody else to come in and develop this. And, and so, you know, and we know that the, the value, I mean, we've seen some of these valuations afterwards, they're like seven, eight, you know, could be even 10, up to $10 million when this thing is all said and done. So uh, I think my proposal is basically go ahead with having an architectural review, uh, but just deleting all the references to this, uh, this mixed use. I'll open up the floor to any questions. I'll be happy to answer anything you may have. Have any questions? Yes, I, ha yes, I have a, a question. Would uh, would uh, uh, your objections uh, to having uh, a standard for mixed use uh, be alleviated if there was an a, an exception uh, built into the uh, the regulations that allowed for an, uh, for uh, an existing an existing building to uh, be relieved from those standards uh, in the event that it's shown that it is uh, 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 commercially unviable to convert an existing building into a mixed use mixed use uh, self storage uh, facility. That's a very good question. And the answer is that would solve the issue with respect to conversion of 1000 silo feet. Now, if somebody did come in and it wasn't the minority, I will say, if somebody wanted to take down the building and do uh, a new construction 
uh, then that the new regulations that proposed would limit uh, would limit their design to the mixed use. So it would solve half the problem. You know, but we only need we I only we only need one solution, right? If there's somebody that wants to come in and do the conversion, uh, which seems to be the majority of the case, uh, but we did have within the last couple of years we did have somebody that thought they may just want to uh, take it down and do their own their own design. So it's a, it's the developer's preference. Well, it does seem to me that that the uh, uh, that the EDIC and and the town planners uh, review of uh, you know both the the market trend and the uh, the weight of uh, uh, of land use policy does tend to favor a mixed use type of situation that it uh, I think it would be helpful to have in the regulations. Uh, you know, a, a standard that created an, um, you know, an, an implicit policy position of promoting the mixed use kind of development instead of being just uh, completely uh, silent on that and, uh, you know, uh, uh, allowing the marketplace uh, solely to govern because, uh, you know, as, as in so many areas in our society, just, uh, you know, putting uh you know putting public policy dependent upon marketplace considerations has led to uh, uh, uh well it's, it's from a social policy standpoint it it's fraught with uh, many dangers so my own my own bias or my own uh, opinion uh does tend to favor a mixed use Kind of solution as opposed to not having uh, any uh, standards as it relates to the type of usage uh, on a, on a piece of property. I, I can only comment to say that nobody to date, uh, and I would say there's probably been thirty or so developers interested in this property. Nobody to date has proposed or had an interest in any mixed use of that one to do self storage. So, and that's why I was, uh, you know, allowing a way out by creating an exception for, uh, you know, buildings that would be converted into, uh, you know, existing buildings proposed for conversion into self storage. That you that in that case. There would be a way of opting out of the of the uh, mixed use uh, facility, but in terms of, you know, the the public policy stance, the the public policy would still be favoring the mis mixed use, uh, you know, type of uh, development. Understood. Can I, can I make a comment? This is D David Drake. Uh, One thousand Saston Highway. How far is the Rocky Hill border? Is that it's got to be less than 5,000 feet, right? I'm guessing. A mile? Yeah. yeah. About that, third day. Yeah, so uh, I guess I'm thinking if he puts, if he has something to put in there, a self storage type unit, this is it. It's the only one. So maybe we can work. <laughs> there won't be a second one. This is it. So maybe we can work around if he has something specific in mind. I mean, the whole regulation would be for this one only, and there's no more after that. Am I, am I correct or wrong there based on this location? I think it depends on uh, what we ultimately decide on the separation. Separate. Well, I understand, but that's what we're deciding now. Right yeah. now it's 5,000. So my point is, if he goes that route and people in the town on that particular spot look at the building and accept maybe no mixed use for that location, that's the end of it. And he finds something, that's it. That's it, there's no more. That's the only spot and we're done. You can throw the regulation away. I thought, you, of course you wouldn't throw it away, but the point is, that's it, unless someone else just comes down. Well, I think that's one of the, the, 
the points. Uh, I think as George has raised uh, and I also mentioned, I think the 5,000 foot uh, radius is, is too excessive and I would tend to favor a 2,500 foot uh, radius. I'll be honest with you, I, I would too. And I also favor what you suggested, maybe an existing building we have leeway regarding mixed use. An also, existing building. George here, uh, I'd like to suggest that the regulations might provide some incentive or the town can informally have incentives. You know what they are. They've been given to other situations around town. I'm not, it may be tax or it may be uh, a use type incentive. I don't know. But that ought to be considered as a possibility to encourage. Uh, even a minimum amount of mixed use, like 10% or something. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I understand what this, what he's saying. Uh, if they want to come in and they don't want the mixed use and they don't have a market for it, we may not get much of anywhere. Dave has a good point of allowing maybe this one in here in some manner, and uh, that would be... I, I, I guess I guess for me, if I'm looking at that building be there forever, if we don't do something. With right, right. But again, if you look at the storage unit at the north side side state highway, if you had something like that, significantly bigger, look like that, or maybe nicer at one thousand side state highway, that'd probably be pretty nice. To tell you the truth, I agree. And and if there's no store in front, would that bother me? Wouldn't bother me in the least bit or an office building or anything. Wouldn't bother me at all. Especially like what Tony said, these things are, you know, six, worth six, seven, eight million dollars. Uh, Peter, did the Borden have any, did they have troubles getting uh, commercial in the first floors of those, that building or buildings? Especially not, the new one? Well, not, not that I'm aware, but they also received several incentives. You guys gave them uh, incentive to some of your requirements. They received a uh, tax incentive and then they received some financing from the Capital Region Development Authority. So I think all of those things probably helped with the any, any financing issues they may have. But I never heard from Marty that he had challenges getting financing because of the mixed use. That may be an issue, and I've heard it's an issue in some cases, but in in uh, his case, I uh, he didn't he didn't mention that to me. So I, I thought it might have been slow on the, getting the commercial, but I okay. he hasn't he hasn't yet filled the commercial, so that may or may not. Uh, but he, I think he's being very selective. Uh, he has one of the um, spaces uh, lined up for a tenant, but I think he's being very careful who the the restaurant, who the food proprietor is, so that it's a, 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 a very, very uh, attractive. Does have the word HUD in it? Oh, <laughs> hello, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, I have I, a question. For, I mean, sorry, I mean, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been here for a while, but quietly, um, uncharacteristically. Um, I, I tend to agree that the 2,500 is is more reasonable than 5,000. I mean, you know, while while this might not be something that we want to encourage on every block of the Silas Dean, it's not, you know, a nox, noxious use that we need to to limit and you know prohibit um, from from going into town. I guess, I guess the other thing too is that you know while mixed use is admirable. I have a I have the feeling that self storage as an industry is kind of um, unique isn't the right word, but it's it's idiosyncratic in terms of, you know, there are people who do self storage and they don't do regular, you know, box retail, they don't do multifamily, they don't do this, they don't do that. And some of the financing sources, you know, for for self storage are um, you know, particular to that industry. So, you know, mixed use might be something that they're not comfortable with as far as um, kind of a, a business model. 
Um, you know, that, that said, um, you know, having, having something go into this property um, is better than having nothing go into this property. I guess we just need to, to look back at whether, um, you know, the incentives should be driving it toward, you know, a new building or toward a, you know, reconfiguration of the existing one. I mean, if it's a new building, it may not work without, you know, incentives of the monetary kind as well as the, the regulatory kind. Um, and if it's just going to be kind of, you know, repainting and reconditioning the existing building, um, you know, frankly, I wouldn't want to waive too many of the requirements as far as the, you know, the architectural and things like that in exchange for, um, you know, giving up on the mixed use. Uh, you know, while, while mixed use would be ideal, you know, I think we're at the point where, you know, the perfect becomes the enemy of the good and we're, we're trying to require something that, that just isn't feasible in the, in the current marketplace. I, I would just add, you know, theoretically, I guess if you were to not be looking at the mixed use, but you were retaining design and architectural features, I guess then you could you could still get into things such as, you know, you, what you can't have the, uh, you know, the garage doors fronting the Silas Dean Highway, and there could be all kinds of things that you could do, which would not prevent somebody to go forward with something that could still make it a much better product for everyone. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to also to another call here, if there was anybody on the line here in the public who wanted to comment on this. Um, and, and if there isn't, I guess, could we just for, for a minute with Peter's help, just sort of figure out where we are timing wise and substantively um, in terms of, uh, you know, what if anything more people feel we need to do to further explore or to make revisions or to, uh, you know, act or not act tonight. And I guess if we're not ready to act tonight, then we also need to think about the current expiration of the moratorium. And uh, Peter, I guess theoretically, if we needed to extend that, we would be able to do that at our next meeting in November if the time for notice and everything works out. So we have two more meetings before the moratorium expires. You have a meeting on December 1st, and then you have a meeting in, I guess it's 13 days from, from tonight, because we're meeting on a Wednesday. So you do have two meetings um, before which you would have to make that decision. I think that would, um, you know, give us plenty of time to, to come back with some language to address the various comments that were made tonight. And then you guys could hash, hash all of those out. So I think we're, we're, we only have one, um, we have one application scheduled for the next meeting. So we should have time, uh, at least on the next agenda to, to do that. So. Was it Tuesday, the 17th of November is the next meeting? Yep. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and if for any reason at that meeting, people felt that you needed to extend the moratorium, you'd still have time to do that, get it noticed and acted on at the following meeting. Right. All right, so do, do, what's Rich, go ahead. John, yeah, before we do anything definitive, I, I just wanted to, what I think is echo one of the comments that you made was that, you know, I, frankly, if, if the choices we have are, are nothing or, you know, a four or five or six million dollar building that doesn't have mixed use, I, I would rather do that. Um, but where I don't want to end up is having a, a $1 million building that doesn't have mixed use. Um, so I, I guess on the, on the first issue, how do people feel about continuing this matter 
to our next meeting? Does everybody feel that we need to do that as the first question? I, I, I think I, you, I think Speaker. I do. Yep. Motion so made to continue to the meeting of the 17th of November. All right, and I, and I guess before before we vote on that, um, would, would the consensus be that we'd like Peter to sort of take into account all the different things that have been talked about tonight and commented and come back to us with some modification on his current proposal? Does that? Yeah, I mean, it, as well as a professional recommendation, you know, sort of, is this a good idea or not? And uh, I'll second George's motion just so that we don't lose track of that. Okay. You want me to give you a quick synopsis of the comments just to make sure um, I have sure. my marching orders for next time? Okay. Sure. So um, somehow factor in um, how, how uh, the reuse of existing buildings would be covered under these new regulations. Um, come back uh, with a recommendation on the 5,000 foot uh, to lessen that. Um, come back with some provisions on um, the visibility of uh, roll up garage doors uh, from the from the street. We do have something in there now that I, Joe, now that I look, uh, but it may need to be uh, fleshed out a little bit more. Uh, do we want to incentivize uh, the language uh, to encourage mixed use above and beyond what's in here right now? Um, give some thought to uh, the uh, business park mixed use and, and whether that's opening the door uh, to something that we didn't uh, anticipate. Uh, take a look at the parking standard, see if that's uh, really within the ballpark of what we want to accomplish. Um, give some thought to the whole concept of the mixed use and take a look at the three-story requirement as it relates to that. So I think what I will follow, uh, the road I'll go down probably is the exception for existing buildings rather than throwing out the whole mixed use multi-story concept um, if, if people are feeling warm and fuzzy about that. I don't want to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater here. So I would probably uh, add some language that addresses the reuse of existing building uh, concept. Peter, I'll, I'd like to reinforce the business park issue because our business park over there, you know, what's the name of it? With the uh, school uh, over on the, off of Wells Road. Oh, you know, Progress okay, Drive. Business. Progress Drive, yeah. Progress Drive. Now, is that what you're talking about? Because there isn't much going on over there. So, and no, there are, other, there are other business park zones scattered all over the place. So, yeah. um, that's what I can think of that I I can see, and it's not nothing's happening. And it's it was once at one time the pride and joy. We expected a lot out of that 20, 30 years ago. Nothing's happened. Yeah, I don't think it's because of our zoning regulations, George. I'll just leave it at that. Oh, okay. Okay, I thought it might be. But I mean, I think this might allow it to go, something like this to go in there. It's a possibility, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll, as I say, I'll give, I'm definitely gonna give some thought to that. Okay, Any, anybody have any further comment or suggestions to Peter before we vote on the motion to continue this public hearing to our next meeting? Uh, just one, 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 uh, just one concern uh, that I'd like to get some clarification on. In terms of our timing, uh, we're not going to run into any of the, the you know, the deadlines for publishing uh, you know, the notice of the uh, adoption of the regulations as it relates to uh, notices to CROG and that sort of thing through, uh, you know, through delaying uh, uh, any resolution of this until uh, the 17th. Is that gonna is that any, pose any problems relative to notice requirements, I guess is the bottom line issue. We shouldn't um, have any issue. Yeah, I don't, well, the only, the only issue is the, 
the 35 day crog um, issue. So um, we're actually past that now anyway. So we're into, I mean, my, the intent, uh, my intent would be to get you something um, and try and encourage a, a vote on whatever it is at your next meeting. And then if we can't arrive at that, then you still got one more meeting. So um, I, I think we'll be fine. Okay, good, thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess with all that said, we have a motion um, and a second to continue this public hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the matter is continued to our next meeting. And uh, let's see, where are we back to the agenda here? Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my agenda up on the screen. Peter, what's our next uh, item? Well, the next agenda item is other business. There is no other business. And the uh, item number five on the agenda are the minutes of the October 20th meeting. Okay, is there a motion to approve those minutes? To approve, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, George. Is there a second? Second. Second, Tom. Any comments? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the minutes are approved. I guess uh, next we have staff reports. I think I uh, sent you an email, but uh, we're pleased to announce that the town was uh, awarded uh, silver certification under the Sust sustainable CT program. Many of the points that uh, we garnered were planning and zoning commission related. Um, so much of the work that you have done either with the plan of development or your regulations uh, got us a number of points towards that certification. So I just want to uh, uh, thank you guys for the work that you've done over the years. We, as, and as you know, we uh, adopted some regulations during that process for the low impact development and, and those types of things that uh, turned out to be um, uh, valuable enough to kick us up to the silver certification. So thank you. Uh, for that. Thank you. Yeah, good job, Peter. And I, I still am skeptical of anything that has silver as the highest level of accomplishment. <laughs> they're, they're coming out with a gold one, Rich, so you'll be okay. happy to hear that. So okay. we'll, we'll go for it. Yeah, at least it should be platinum, at least. No. Magnesium or something. I don't know. <laughs> Rare <Right>. earth minerals. <laughs> <laughs> I guess next is public comment on uh, general matters of planning and zoning. Anyone in the public with any comments? Okay, if none, correspondence. Uh, any correspondence, Peter? Mark uh, Trahan has this problem. Every EDIC meeting, no one ever gives them correspondence, so he feels left out. So he gets to see that you guys don't get much in the way of correspondence either. So it would take okay. so. I think silver is good. I would take it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, finally, I guess pending applications. I see you've got one listed there, Peter. For the is that for our next meeting? Yes. Okay. So it'll just be the continued regulation discussion and this one item as the public hearing items. I'll probably put this one first. You can get that. We can get that out of the way. If there's there may be some neighbors um, who show up for that too. So. Okay. Is, is, is every and anyone uh, just curious if there's any large number of people who will not be around on November 17th? Okay, good. So uh, a motion to adjourn would be uh, would be good as our next item. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second, second forward. Forward. Motion. Tony, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.